Apparently, sometimes I don't watch the sh I don't watch the news because I'm a kid, and apparently, every time, apparently, Grandpa just gives me a remote after we watch the Powerball. It's the Powerball. <laughs> Tell me about the ride. What did you think about the ride? Well, it was great. Why? Because apparently, you're spinning around, and apparently, every time you get dizzy, yeah. the slowest dudes get dizzy. <laughs> Apparently we're talking about apparent mineral corticoid excess, right? So firstly, what is mineral corticoid? All it is is aldosterone. So a quick recap of your adrenal glands, uh, anatomy. You've got your cortex, which is your outer bit, and this is made of three layers. Uh, and then your inner bit is called the medulla. Um, and this is the guy that makes adrenaline and noradrenaline. So also your um, your kidney has a medulla, but this, your adrenals also have their own medulla. So there's three layers. Um, and if you remember in FNM, the way to kind of measure kidney kind of flow is through something called GFR. And handily, these are the same kind of letters, the starting letters, of each of the zones of the cortex from outer to inner. So we've got our glomerulosa, which makes aldosterone, and remember it is that aldosterone acts in the kidney and your glomerulus is in your kidney as well. Uh, then you've got your fasciculosa, which makes cortisol, and your reticularis, which makes, um, so I say R for reproduction, R makes uh, DHEA. Cool. So the one we're focusing on is glomerulosa, so this makes aldosterone. What is aldosterone basically? It's a hormone that goes along to the principal cells um, in the DCT and also the collecting duct, uh, mainly the collecting duct. And it comes along and binds on the basolateral side, so this is the side with the blood, to the mineral corticoid receptor. And upon binding, then it basically causes transcription of two channels. So it's going to cause um, ENAC to be transcribed, which takes up sodium, so reabsorbs sodium. And then it's going to cause the renal outer medullary K plus, don't worry, you don't need to know that um, channel to also be transcribed. So this dumps K plus out. And basically, the ENAC and the K, they're happily married together. They work together as a couple, essentially, they act as antiporters. So as soon as you take sodium in, uh, you dump K plus out. Nice. So, aldosterone acts on this MR receptor and does this, okay, takes up sodium, so for example, when sodium is low. However, a little problem is that cortisol also can act on the MR receptor, and therefore, even if aldosterone isn't present, even if we don't want to take up sodium, cortisol can come along and um, and basically act on the receptor anyway, it kind of fits into it anyway, and it's more potent. Um, so it has greater specific specificity and um, affinity to the MR receptor than aldosterone. However, uh, this usually isn't a problem because we have an enzyme called 11 to hsd type 2, and this comes along to cortisol and goes skadoosh. Um, and converts it to cortisone. So as you can see, cortisone, the product, doesn't fit into the mineral, uh, mineral corticoid receptor. So in normal circumstances, um, this enzyme is expressed locally, um, therefore stopping the MR being activated by cortisol, so being activated involuntarily. Um, just don't confuse this with the enzyme, which is very similar sounding, called 11-beta-hydroxylase, and that's the enzyme that's involved in salt-sparing congenital adrenal hyperplasia. The one that we're focusing on in AME is 11-beta-HSD type 2. So just be clear about that. Um, Although the names kind of are similar, they're nothing to do with each other. Okay, so now we're going to get to our pathology. Basically, all is going well when this uh, enzyme converts cortisol to cortisone. However, if this enzyme mutates, um, it can be problematic. And also, um, there's a couple of things that can stop this enzyme working. So, for example, it can be act inactivated naturally um, by biopigments or sterols, um, so like cholesterol, steroids such as progesterone. And then there's also a couple of, of uh, iatrogenic causes. So, uh, ferizamide, which is a loop diuretic, acts on the uh, loop of Henle. This can actually inactivate this enzyme and therefore cause AME. Um, I can't pronounce that, but yeah, uh, a drug use for peptic ulcers. Um, so I've highlighted them because they're kind of important. And also herbal remedies containing licorice. And they all kind of do a number on this enzyme and stop it working. So the symptoms, what's going to happen? We can basically have the MR receptor being activated even when we don't want to. So even when we don't have aldosterone, just because cortisol is there and it's going to bind to it. So your symptoms are going to be you're going to have excessive transcription of ENAC and ROMK, meaning you get high NA plus and plasma. And this is called antinaturesis. So naturesis, urine meaning urine. Nat Na Na is like sodium, so this normally naturesis is weighing out sodium. We're getting the opposite of that, so therefore we're getting a lot of sodium uptake, <clears throat> and um, therefore our sodium is going to be high. And on a blood film, this might be higher than uh, one for five minimals. Uh, you'd also see uh, basic osmosis where salt goes water follows, so you'll also see increased fluid resorption. Um, your blood fluid is going to therefore increase, so your blood volume expands. This is called hypovolemic, and therefore your blood pressure is going to expand as well, so it's hypertension. Um, obviously, that's bad, it's going to be bad for your heart. You're going to be getting rid of a lot of ROMK as well, because the more ENAC you have, the more ROMK you have. So you're going to be getting a lot of K plus, um, hyperkalemia, um, and hyperkalemia basically can affect your ion balance for muscles essentially. Um, so it can cause muscle fatigue and also cardiac weakness as well. If you've been paying attention, which you hopefully have been, these are exactly the same symptoms as something called Kohn syndrome. Uh, the pathophysiology is different. That is when you have an overactive uh, zona glomerulosa, for example, a benign tumor, um, and these will cause these same three symptoms. Just, just so you know. Okay, so how are you going to treat it? You can basically um, you want to fix the enzyme, but there's currently nothing to fix the enzyme. Or we could inactivate the MR receptor, so that's what we do. We inactivate the MR receptor, therefore we stop kind of these downstream effects. And we do that with our drug spiral lactone. Um, this causes decreased uh, expression of ENAC and decreased ROMK. However, because of the decreased ROMK, we, now, we may now get um, hyperkalemia because we're not excreting enough K+. Um, that can cause like a side effect of nausea. And also spiro has um, the unfortunate side effect of gynecomastia, meaning basically male, um, particularly males, uh, breast tissue growth. Um, right. 
Okay, we can also get, say this enzyme is normal and it's not being inactivated, we can also, in rarer circumstances, get AME if we've got too much uh, cortisol. So if there's um, an excess of cortisol, then it can basically overwhelm the capacity of this enzyme, um, and you might get an excess of cortisol in Cushing. So Cushing's comes in Cushing's syndrome, in Cushing's disease, there's obviously going to be a video on this later, but the syndrome arises from the adrenals, and I remember disease is worse off, generally you're worse off if you've got something in your head. So if you've got a tumor in your head, um, that's the disease. Also just, you know, to kind of and bring things together. Uh, Cushing's also causes moon face and buffalo hump and uh, weeping. But yeah, if you don't know what that is, uh, it'll be clear later on. All right, uh, let's talk about the genetics of the disease. So it's a recessive uh, mutation, meaning you need two copies. Um, and therefore, it's usually when you um, have like, uh, so, like re relatives to a parents, like cousins, essentially, and then you get two copies of the recessive thingy. However, basically carriers of the allele. So if you just have one, um, muta one mutant um, allele and then one normal, um, it's thought to have basically to help you take up more sodium. So remember, the symptom is excess sodium. That's if you have two. If you just have one, you'll also get more sodium as well, um, but you won't necessarily get you know as bad kind of symptoms. Um, and this is thought to be advantageous in places with low sodium. So and low sodium diets, just having one allele will kind of make your MR more active, and therefore you'll get more sodium uptake um, from your kidney. This is known as semi-dominance. I've highlighted this because this is a concept that comes up in GDC. Um, so semi-dominance is basically when you have just one copy of a gene, and that can cause a different advantageous or, or, or advantageous phenotype uh, rather than having two copies. Um, it'll be clear later on what that means, but there's two other examples that you have to know. For example, sickle cell, um, just having one HBS gene will give the advantageous trait of reducing your likelihood to catch malaria. So that's semi-dominance, whereas having two will obviously cause sickle cell. Uh, and then another one is called familial hypercholesteremia, when you have essentially too much cholesterol um, in your blood. It's an inherited thing. Having one copy can is basically better than having two copies. All right, um, okay, just to wrap up, there's a couple more things to add. Um, so we've got this enzyme, or again, don't confuse it with 11-beta-hydroxylase, that's the one in uh, CAH. Um, so 11-beta-HSD type 2 goes skoosh and converts cortisol into cortisone. Um, the opposite enzyme is a reductase, so this is like a oxygenation reaction. This is a reductase, reductase, enzy reductase enzyme, and it converts cortisone into cortisol, so basically it's the opposite. Um, and you can imagine like you have both of these enzymes because you want to regulate um, stuff in the receptor essentially. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about type 1 enzyme. Oh, the, the only thing is that the way I remember, I don't know if this helps or not, um, I remember that the first thing is type 1 and this has got a 1 in it, so this acts on cortisone first, but if that doesn't help you, then don't worry. I just learned them. Um, okay, 11-beta-HSD2, uh, so this guy, he also has another function, um, which is protecting the fetus from excess cortisol. So cortisol in the baby can cause, like, um, it causes differentiation of tissues. So for example, it causes, um, it peaks at the end of gestation and causes lung surfactant, um, and it also causes, for example, development of the adrenal glands. If you have too much cortisol, um, then it can be bad. So we're protected the, um, as fetuses by this enzyme, which uh, scoduces cortisol into cortisone, to therefore, like, so um, the maternal cortisol doesn't go to the baby and uh, cause premature differentiation. So if this enzyme is lacking, you get excess cortisol on the baby. Um, basically, you get stim uh, this stimulates premature differentiation of fetal tissues. Uh, for example, like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. For example, your adrenal glands. Um, and this basically is it, a growth disorder, um, and it leads to basically small babies. So it's a bad thing. Um, a little guy called Baker, he named this after himself. This hypothesis basically, babies born with this have an increased later on of serious diseases. So that's the Baker's hypothesis. Um, and that's when this enzyme is not uh, present in your placenta. And that's the end.